brought to you by Brass and Unity. We make wearable conversation starters. Our new Buddy Check packs are available now. Grab one and check on one of your closest buddies. They may need it now more than ever. Go to BrassandUnity.com, use the code UNITY, and get 20% off. And let's all heal together. And brought to you by Combat Flip Flops. Bad for running and even worse for fighting. Combat Flip Flops are your ticket to the unarmed forces by providing you with military-inspired quality footwear for men and women. To help support the podcast and in support of women in developing countries, head over to CombatFlipFlops.com and become a part of their unarmed forces today. Be sure to use the code UNITY at checkout and get 25% off. And brought to you by GFDA. Good fucking design advice. The voice in your head and the foot up your ass. GFDA makes prints, drinkware, and apparel for people who want to do their fucking best. Go and use the code UNITY and get 10% off now on anything on their site, including our collaborative product, Fucking Help Somebody. And brought to you by Daisy May Hat Co., the custom hat company based in Nashville, Tennessee. They make custom one-of-a-kind hats from wide-brimmed fedoras to cowboy hats. All of their hats are 100% beaver felt, and it's the highest quality hat you can get. They also have the coolest shirts ever. You can use the code BRASS at checkout for 15% off your entire order. Go and check out daisymayhats.com. Embrace the fever. Live the dream. And brought to you by American Yogi. In a world increasingly driven toward the grind, find your outlet for peace. American Yogi is a mindfulness-based apparel and wellness brand with international retreats, free classes, and rad clothing and accessories to support you along life's journey. Find American Yogi on Instagram at liveamericanyogi or at americanyogi.com. American Yogi is proud to support the Brass and Unity podcast and its community with the code BRASS15. Join the mindful counterculture. Live American Yogi. Andrew Risebull, welcome to the show. I am super excited to have someone that is completely out of the realm of who we normally talk to. And I found you on Instagram. I got attracted to your photos and I was just pulled in so deep. And then I started to do a deep dive as to why you're such an interesting human being. And there is a lot to talk about, my friend. Yes, thank you. I'm excited to be here. It's it's always a to- topics that I love talking about. So uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy it and don't get too bored. Stay awake today. You, though, don't worry, they will. Uh, I su- as soon as I explain what you do for a living, I'm sure they won't uh, want to fall asleep. You are a competitive cold water diver and you're a free diver. You can hold your breath for seven and a half minutes in the freezing cold water in a wetsuit uh yeah well uh to clarify a few things those are a few different separate things so seven and a half minutes i can hold my breath seven and a half minutes right but that would be if i'm not moving at all and and in a comfortable setting if i'm in the cold water i can't do seven and a half minutes um then it then it would be probably more like five uh maybe six but yeah like the cold water (laughs) makes it more ridiculous but yeah yeah (laughs) I love, I really, let me clarify. It's only five minutes. I can hold my breath in freezing cold water. It's fine. Most people can't sit in it, but I can hold my breath underwater for that. Okay. All right. And and that would be one more clarification. That would be not moving at all. If I'm diving the longest dive while I'm expending energy, burning oxygen, that would be about four minutes and 10 seconds or so. I think that was my longest dive while swimming around exploring. That is insane when you think about the brain and the body and how it works that is kind of intimidating to hear i'm excited to talk to you because not only do you do an extreme sport that seems really fascinating but you seem to do an extreme sport that a lot of people are catching on to nowadays and i i think most people would have to thank wim hof for that the cold water breathing and the the cold plunges and the physical fitness and all of that, but there's so much more to cold water than, than just working out and, and using it as a, as a healing modality. Yeah, for sure. Like certainly in the last 10 years, social media and and just the internet in general being, being a, such a tool and keystone of our day-to-day life, like free diving as a sport is just booming and same with cold water, um, cold water dips that people do and and the Wim Hof stuff of course that's everything is just blowing up all right now I'd love to I'd love to kind of go back a little bit early in your life to understand why somebody decided that holding their breath for a living in cold water felt like the right career choice 
So let's yeah. go, let's go back to when you're a kid. Do your parents do this? Are you around this? Is this something you're exposed to when you're young? Uh, yeah, if your parents drop you on your head too many times, then sometimes <laughs> you, you make poor decisions as an adult. Um, no, uh, actually, I've always, I've always loved sports in general and being outside. And I loved exploring. That was, I guess, expressed through a lot of camping trips that I used to do and uh, lots of time just swimming in the water. But I never knew that free diving was even a thing. As a kid, I always wanted to scuba dive. That was like my life goal. Um, but then when I when I was about 20 or so, so about 10 years ago, um, then my friend and I, we were going on a camping trip up in Tobamori and we were really excited um, for the camping aspects and the, the, that 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 was familiar and we knew it was going to be fun. But then we also knew that there were shipwrecks up there. And from the pictures that we had seen, they looked like they were quite shallow. So we were like, oh, you know what, we'll bring our snorkeling gear. And we'll go snorkel those shipwrecks. That's going to be fun. So um, we get to these shipwrecks. And then my friend, he, he dares me like, oh, I bet you can't touch the bottom. So I just take a big breath and I go down and um, I'm swimming. And I knew enough how to, how to pop your ears, how to equalize your ears, the pressure as you go down. And uh, I was able to touch the bottom, touch, and then come back up. And I was so pumped. I get to the surface and I'm just... Like, wow, that was so deep. And my friend's high-fiving me and he couldn't believe it. Um, at that point, I thought I was the deepest human being in the world on one breath. Um, <laughs> but little did I know, freediving was actually a sport that people train and dedicate their lives to. And they can do insane depths and insane numbers. So um, going back now, the shipwrecks that I originally dove that got me into freediving... Um, those they're still great wrecks that we love to explore it's just now whenever we go back it's always in the back of my mind i'm kind of laughing at my my younger self because in reality they're only about 16 feet deep like five meters deep which is nothing from a free diving perspective now at all <laughs> so you 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 start on this journey and you decide at that point i have superhuman lungs and i'm gonna take this and i'm gonna <laughs> run with this Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I, I went on the internet after that camping trip and I, I typed into Google, how do you hold your breath longer? Uh, just to see if there's any any tips that maybe someone else had done a little bit of uh, this kind of stuff before. And then, yeah, so many things kept on coming up. So many good things, bad things. I didn't know <laughs> at the time. So I just kind of made it up as I went along just from learning on the, on the internet, which I did that for a couple of years and I was a super sketchy diver. Um, somehow I survived. <laughs> I had a lot of fun, but I, I broke a lot of rules. And then I, um, I took my first free diving course two years in, I would say after a little bit of a, a little bit of heartbreak, a, a girl uh, mm. dumped me out of nowhere and I was like, Oh, so sad and whatnot. So then, um, I, I decided, you know what, like, let's see if I can actually take a course in this. And then I went online. I was looking at places in the Bahamas. There's a course running soon in the UK. And I was like, okay, well that coincides with my work schedule. I can take the time off and maybe I can make a trip and, and learn how to learn some tips on how to do this better. And then just before, I guess I was going to book that trip to the Bahamas. I, I found out that there's actually teachers in Toronto that did this. And I couldn't believe it. It was in two weeks, two weeks from that day. And I signed up immediately because I was like, wow, well, I don't have to pay for a flight, uh, pay for somewhere to stay. And I can actually learn it in Toronto. And then maybe after I learn, then I can take a trip and explore. So yeah, like in that first course, I learned so, 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 so much, an unbelievable amount. And I learned it from a credible source instead of just random people on the internet who, who <laughs> say one one person says this and the other says this so um yeah my free diving like grew exponentially at that time and another huge benefit of taking that that first course is i met my my best friend and dive buddy jeff coombs he's the guy that takes all those photos that you see and videos yeah, they're absolutely wild, by the way, and we'll totally get into those. So please do remind me of him afterwards. Yeah, for you, sure. When you 
When you start learning online how to free dive, I'm assuming the thing that you're looking up the most at that point is, is your breath and learning how to deal with the breath and the movement. Am I wrong? Um, I would say that you're wrong. Um, okay. Just because like people, the, the perception is that the, the breath matters so much in how you take your breath and your breathing method. But primarily, especially when you're starting out, what actually minds uh sorry what actually matters so much when you're starting out is your mind so mentally you're always going to have limitations of um you know what like i can't do this like oh that's so deep or that's so far or that's such a long time and then you're going to give up way before your actual physical limit is so like like i can tell you right now you can hold your breath for three minutes physically as long as you're in somewhat decent physical shape and, and you don't have like I don't know you're not smoking 10 packs of cigarettes a day you should be able to hold your breath for at least three minutes it's just mentally that's going to be extremely difficult at first okay so then this is god you're great so explain to me that let's get right into this because it's something I want to understand okay no, no, no. <laughs> you see I get excited I get excited yeah, because great. this is this is fantastic because the thing that people don't understand and something we talk so much about in our community is the mental health the well-being the mind it just seems like now in the past couple decades whether it's because of social media or, or the internet and people's access to things the mind is now being discussed in a way that it hadn't been before whether that's because of war injury and PTSD, whether that's on the job issues, whether that's professional athletes and looking at the way they train, they eat and they function. Things are a lot different. We have a lot of science behind the body now and the mind and the body. So when you're in a course like this or somebody that wants to understand how you go from I'm going to snorkel to I'm going to learn how to control my mind to the point where I'll be able to hold my breath for a minimum of three minutes. Can you walk me through that entire process? Because the mind is something now that people are trying to harness, whether it's just for their own well-being or whether it's from a manifestation standpoint or a physical fitness. And I know our listeners in particular, being 86% men, women get on it, are athletes and are people that are going through things with mental wellness and they're wanting to understand how to be able to control the mind in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so much to talk about uh, on that subject. Like a lot of people get into the sport because of mental health issues or, or like crisis in their life. Like for me, it, for example, I, I started out on like, I guess, just, just, wanting to explore like that's where I took that first snorkeling trip and I got into the sport by accident so I'm kind of a little bit of a funny story but then what really got into me was my my first course and I took that because you know like my my girlfriend at the time dumped me like out of nowhere and I was like yeah. oh the, the, my, everybody has that one man where it's like it, my life yeah. is over but it changed your life yeah for sure and then and then my wife she's also another uh really great free diver and she comes under the ice with us and all that and she got into the sport after her mother passed away so she mm. lost her dad when she was about five years old and then her her mom when she was 25 years old so okay. shortly after that once again like a big crisis in your life and then you're looking on how, how to redefine yourself or like how to pursue things that you um didn't have time before or maybe you're looking for that mental distraction to to ease the the grieving or or what have you so a sport like this it, it ends up working really amazing uh from a mental healing standpoint because you're just it's you're forced to deal with this exact immediate moment because you're doing something that is let's be honest it, it can be very dangerous you're holding your breath underwater um you have to be focused in that moment and you can't be thinking oh wait like oh no my 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 girlfriend dumped me or my right. work day was really stressful or I'm, I'm maybe I'm gonna get laid off next month or um do I have enough money to pay the bills you have to think like okay right now I'm underwater maybe let's say 20 meters deep or or deeper and I need to get back up. I'm enjoying this. This is amazing. I need to focus on my technique to, to make sure that I have the most time down here. And then 
when you get back up, you start breathing and you're not even thinking at all about any of this stuff. You're just, you're just completely enjoying the day, enjoying the moment. And yeah, it's, it, it, it forces you to, I guess, leave all that stuff behind. It seems like there's certain activities that when mental, uh, the mental wellness comes into, into play that are really advantageous for healing because they're, they're an activity that you have to hyper-focus on. You can't just, like you said, you'll die. And the fact yeah. that you're doing it under things like ice, uh, terrify me, give me heart palpitations when I think about it. <laughs> Um, well, when you grow up and, and you're based in Ontario, Canada. So when you grow up, or at least when I grew up in Ontario, there was always the conversation of staying away from the lakes and staying away from the water when the winter happens because of the ice. And there's, there's always deaths in Ontario, uh, around winter time of people falling through the ice. And yet you seem to enjoy cutting holes in them and deciding that's where you're going to swim. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I had lots of those conversations growing up with my parents or other friends, parents or authorities or whatever, because we used to play a lot of pond hockey. Mm -hmm. So we were always trying to get out there as early as possible to start off our pond hockey season. And then you'd always have to be careful with the ice to make sure, okay, where are the weak spots? And then you hear of these people fell through. Thankfully, they're okay, but it could happen to you. Mm -hmm. So for sure, like, and, and those are great conversations. Th those are super important from an ice safety perspective, especially when you're dealing with kids. Um, but, but then um, to, to explore the ice safely in the sense that you can now start diving under it. A, a big part of it is one, like working your way up to, to the point that you'd be confident enough to, to make that jump in the sense that, you want to be a, a, an expert free diver before you start doing anything with mm -hmm. the ice. And you want to have experience in the cold water before you start thinking like, okay, I'm going to start chopping holes and diving under. So that'd be one thing. And then another, a huge piece is also your gear. You're so dependent on your gear. If you have poor gear, you're going to get cold much faster. Um, and, and you're going to have risks of associated with that. So um, and you don't want any gear that's going to fail while you're diving. Like you don't want a dive mask that's going to start leaking on you or fins that are going to fall apart on you or a wetsuit that's going to get a hole really easily, those kind of things. So, uh, yeah, like investing in decent gear is super important. And I guess the other component, the third last main component I would say is the, the weather conditions and the ice conditions on that day. So we do a lot of things with like my wife knows it during the winter i am on looking at weather and satellite imagery and all this stuff like i don't know i don't even want to think about how many hours it is. like pro <laughs> probably i don't know probably realistically maybe at least an hour a day i would say maybe as much as two hours where i'm watching the ice come in or i'm watching it move or how the wind is going to come in and i know that okay with this sort of wind it's going to affect the ice in this way and it's not going to be safe or it can still be safe, but let's change our procedures from what we'd normally do to, to be able to dive it in those conditions. So yeah, those would be the three main things. It sounds like you spend more time in front of, uh, the weather than the weathermen do. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> oh, just by accuracy alone. Um, okay. So when somebody decides I want to take up free diving, I want to try this activity. This is something I want to do. You go into a course and what, what, are, what do they start teaching you? How does, how does a course like free diving happen? Cause in my mind, I would go start holding your breath, jump in the water, get better holding your breath. What there's so much more <laughs> to this than that. And I'd love to hear all about it. Yeah. Yeah. Like our typical free diving course, the it'll, it'll be two days long uh, or well, sorry, four days long, two days. We'll start off in the classroom and in the pool. And those days would be about five hours in a classroom with breaks in between so maybe four hours of actually talking about theory and and important stuff before we hop in the water and then at the end of the first day like after the five hours in the class then we go for two or three hours in the pool and we put into practice these different things that we learned and then the, you come back the second day and then we do another five day five hours of talking about some more uh important things and then we 
spend the second half of that day also in the pool and put those things to practice. And then, so before you even jump into the open water, you already have two full days of really in, I guess, not in depth theory at that point in your entry level course, but it's, it's very, a very good general broad overview. That's giving you enough to know to safely dive with a trained buddy also. Um, before you even hop in the open water and then we have two full days in the open water where you where you take what you learned in the classroom and in the pool and now we're just adding instead of diving horizontally in a pool or holding your breath stationary now we're doing it while going uh for depth too and that that adds a few other things like the pressure builds up and you have to equalize the pressure in your ears to go deeper and mentally, once again, going back to the mind, mentally, it's a lot more difficult typically for people. So we have to face maybe some fears and work on work on that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, that, that would be your typical entry level free diving course, similar to like your, your paddy open water. Um, that would be your beginning scuba course, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So when you when you start doing these types of courses obviously for you it sounds like um you know i'm sure there's more than just the single heartbreak in your life but when you start going into these courses and you start doing these dives did you find for you there was it brought up any other types of anxieties or any other types of fears that you didn't necessarily know existed uh for me personally not not really nothing nothing too crazy um not yeah really nothing too crazy for me like i mean you have your obvious small fears which are just your rational mind like fear on the one hand is a good thing like it's reminding yourself look you're you're in the middle of a shipwreck and you're let's say 30 meters down 100 feet down like we do have to be careful here so that that kind of like fear in the back of your mind is important to as a motivator to keep you focused and to keep you um keep you smart underwater but i've never i've never had an experience where i've had fear so strong that i'm panicking or i'm i'm freaking out and it's actually hindering my dive so but certainly i've i've seen it many times with with other people so it's very very situational different people might have fears associated with the water like my wife actually she, she there's a lot to talk about with her she she actually drowned as a child like like twice I think even um as like a two-year-old in the sense where she she had to get pulled out and resuscitated by her uncle yeah so so she had a lot of fears around the water growing up and she actually didn't even swim like at at people's pool parties she would just sit on the deck and be like oh I'm having fun I don't want to go in the water though um don't want to drown today yeah so then um after her mother passed away then she's not just facing the fear fears associated with or grieving and and that sort of stuff but she's also now facing her fear of the water and um so she she had a lot of things that she was facing but she handled it really really well and like even though mentally internally she was she was having these kind of fear conversations she didn't show it from an external point of view. Like for me watching her, I couldn't tell, but then she would explain these things after. And did she find that with the, the actual diving itself, that was the thing that took, whether it's the pain, the trauma, the, the loss, the, the sadness away, or was it that there was this compartmentalization where she was able to just, well, this is what it is and just move past it. Yeah, I think I think a little bit of both, maybe. Um, I actually now now that I, I'm thinking about it a little bit more, I do remember one time where she did show fear externally. Um, it was during a rescue simulation, so I went down um, to I think maybe about 15 meters deep, like 50 feet, and then I had to fake black out so that she had to pull me up and rescue rescue me, and then bring me back. And then I do remember. While she was doing that, she was faced with not only being underwater, like which was a, a fear all of her life, but now also with, um, you know, someone, the potential of someone dying, even though it was just a simulation. It's just that triggered something mentally that that she really, it affected her in a crippling way, almost. 
I can imagine. I mean, especially being the spouse of someone watching, even though it's a simulation, watching somebody you love dearly drop or go or be like that and not necessarily mm -hmm. being able to perform under that, um, that type of stress is always a nerve wracking thing. Like you said, even though it's a fear, it's still, it still triggers the same type of response in the body that it would if it were a real situation. Yeah, for sure. At, at that point, she she wasn't my spouse. But uh, if you ask her, she had uh, maybe some feelings for her instructor at that point. So <laughs> uh, okay, so the intentions yeah. were there. And it was out yeah. in the universe, the world knew what it was doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, as it does, as usual, that's, that's, that's interesting to see that somebody was able to overcome some type of fear, one that is very rational as well. I think water safety and water in general, there is a, I did not realize once I became an adult, still struggling with that. Once I became an adult, I realized how many individuals are afraid of water, uh, mm -hmm. never taught to swim, have a uh, major fear. I, and it doesn't even necessarily need to be deep open water. It can be mm -hmm. any water. There's a, a significant amount of individuals in my life that are actually quite afraid of water. Yeah, for sure. It's it, it's bizarre from my standpoint, from a, a kid who grew up around water and loving water, just swimming as much as I could, or, you know, going on a, a motorboat or, or anything like that. Th things that I didn't even think that um, people might not be, be mentally okay with, but then, uh, now, now that I'm a freediving instructor, then I see people coming into my courses all the time with fear, fears from childhood or whatever, uh, around the water. And it's surprising, but then admirable that they're coming to face those fears. Right. Of course. And it's kind of interesting. You're like a quasi therapist. It's you, you kind of take on two different roles when you're dealing, um, uh, being a free diving instructor, you obviously have the, the sense of keeping people safe and teaching them a skill, but it seems like you're also a bit of a therapist in opening up because individuals don't necessarily know what they're struggling with until they realize they're struggling with it or faced with it. Yeah, for sure. And they also don't really realize their, their potential underwater or in the water. Um, and and that's like what I talked about at the beginning, like you can hold your breath for three minutes. I'm confident of that, but also <laughs> underwater, I'm confident that you can, you have the breath hold to make it down to, um, 70 feet, like 20, 22, 23 meters safely. It's just the thought of being that deep underwater is just crazy, especially from my perspective where, where it always kind of hits home for me. If, if I'm walking on a, uh, let's say a, a hike where there's cliffs and I know that these cliffs from the brochure or whatever, or just from researching that they're, let's say 80 feet tall um, or a hundred feet tall or whatever. And then, then you're at the top of the cliff and you look down and you think, Oh my goodness, that's a long way. Mm -hmm. But then from a free diving perspective, I don't even think twice about going down to those depths. Like it just doesn't scare me anymore, but <laughs> it's just the, the perspective that you have can really, change how you think about a distance or a depth well perspective can change how you think about anything really mm -hmm. i mean think about that if, if if you had never gone through what you went through and you probably wouldn't be where you're at right now perspective can change in a blink of an eye when you're given the opportunity to see something differently very often people just don't push themselves um, psychologically or physically to be able to gain a different perspective on something like as extreme as free diving swimming or being in the water when you say, when you speak of being up above cliffs that way, the only re way I can rationalize your fear with that and not diving is the falling aspect because water, obviously you're not going to fall through it the same way you're going to yeah. fall through air and crush your brain. You're going to have a slower descent. You'll maybe just pass mm -hmm. out. I mean, there's both really not great, but that's the difference in my ideas, like rationalizing the fear around standing above a cliff that tall versus jumping into water that deep. There's a lot of really great uh, research around, obviously, uh, meditation and uh, breath work and things like that. And I'd love to know if any of that is something that happens in your daily life, in your practice, or in your families in order to be able to do and teach a profession like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's um, there's kind of two perspectives, two main perspectives in freediving around breath work. Um, there's, there's one perspective of I guess more of the, I don't know how to call it, like, like more almost esoteric, like, 
or hippie or you know like approach to it and then there's there's more of there's then there's like the more logical rational like um a plus b equals c sort of approach and i i personally fall more under the a plus b equals c approach where um and and my teaching kind of falls more under that perspective so to speak so um i forget what the original question was but well, just that when you're when you're looking at breath work and like you said, yours is definitely more of a we'll we'll just go with like a what's a great word for this logical way of looking at breath work mm. rather than uh the other word I say is a woo woo way. That's yeah, I use okay. I use that word to describe me a lot, so that's why I just say it. Um, people know exactly what I mean, but that. When you're looking at that, is that something that you and your wife integrate into your daily life? Is that something that you practice? Right. Because for mental, for your mental well-being alone, it seems like free diving is like more of a moving meditation for you. So is that something you guys practice like on land? Is that something you integrate into your life um, for practicing of breath holds or just for general mental well-being with the breath, with the breath work itself? Right. No, not so much for, for us personally. Um, but certainly like I'll do a lot of breath holds dry on the couch in the same way that people like interesting people like Wim Hof do. It's just now my, my goals and my, um, perspective on it is different. Like I'm trying to train this as a sport where I want to be able to hold my breath for a longer and longer period of time. Whereas he's coming at it more from the side of things of, um, it's, it's healing and it's so, so his, his focus when he's doing his breath work is more around the the physical sensations that you get. And to be clear, I, I really enjoy that side of things too. Like when I'm holding my breath, I love the feeling where, but then when I'm holding my breath in my day-to-day -day routine, whether that's just on the couch, if I can't get to the water, like if it's bad weather or something, um, then, then I'm my approach mentally, I'm, I'm prepared more for, okay, like I want to hold my breath for a longer period of time. So this is the work that I need to put in. And, um, I I'd say that for me, when I start doing, let's say my, my static breath hold, like my dry on the couch training for me, it usually takes a little bit of time to get into that mode. Like it usually takes me maybe a couple of weeks where the first couple of weeks, I don't really enjoy it so much. And I just have to do it just out of, um, out of discipline. And I know that then I'm going to start to enjoy it. Um, and that's actually sort of this time of year where I start to transition from the open water diving. I guess it's foggy. You can't see up there, <laughs> but there, there's a lake right back there. So <laughs> where, where we're transitioning from the open water diving, where we're diving as much as possible exploring recreationally or maybe we're training for for trying to dive deeper um into this season where it's really wavy on the lakes and it's getting colder and bad visibility so it's not as enjoyable to dive so then i transition my focus to um just training either at home or maybe at a pool so then it's always a little bit of a a shift and it takes it takes a bit to learn to love it again but then once I get into the into my static mode or my uh, dry breath hold training mode, then I then I learn to love it and I look forward to it each day. Where I I'm just sitting on my couch for, let's say an hour or an hour and a half, just doing my routine of breath hold after breath hold after breath hold, and just enjoying the silence of it, um, the focus of it, and um, yeah, just just the mental aspects of it too, for sure. It seems like that is your that is your version of the meditation, regardless of it being super fun. Sometimes at the beginning, I think that's the conversation I have with a lot of people where they're like, well, I don't I can't meditate. I can't sit still that long. My brain won't shut off that long. It won't it won't do that. But in reality, like you said, I know comfortably if you're a decently in shape person, I can you can for sure hold your breath for three minutes. And I look at that and go, no way. But you're like, yeah. no, I know that because that is just what the body can do if you if you yeah. teach it and give it the opportunity it's the same with meditation and any sort of activity it sucks at first it's not supposed to be super easy or everyone would be doing it all of the time but 
meditation and things like that and like static breathing and any sort of breathing exercises, they're not going to be the most enjoyable at the beginning. But if you give them time and you integrate those tools into your life, it's going to make for a much easier, much better life, in my opinion. It seems like diving is that for you. Yeah, absolutely. I would 100% agree. And whether that's diving in the open water, like like we were doing the last many months, or now we're shifting to maybe more pool training or on the couch, then yeah, it's still that that part of my day that I really look forward to. And yeah, it's just a, an opportunity to clear my mind of everything else and focus on the breath pools. Silly question. How does somebody go to a public pool and have a discussion with a lifeguard about the fact that you're going to sit at the bottom of the pool and they don't need to be concerned? Yeah, that's actually, that brings up a really good point. Um, this is something that you definitely don't want to go just to any random pool and just tell the lifeguard, uh, I'm going to hold my breath at the bottom of the pool. Like, don't worry about me. Um, you definitely like there's, there's deaths, um, unfortunately every year in Canada and worldwide, I'm sure there's tons more. Like I've read a number of deaths in the pool of, of people holding their breath because people, they, they assume that the lifeguard counts as a proper safety buddy for free diving, but I'm not bashing lifeguards like lifeguards, their training just doesn't cover these kind of risks and, and uh, blackouts that you could have if you hold your breath for too long. Um, lifeguards are trained to look for things like, panic swimmers people thrashing or looking uncomfortable in that way there whereas if they see someone at the bottom of the pool maybe swimming laps back and forth then they think like oh wow they're like they're strong and comfortable like i don't really have to pay as close attention i guess or if they see someone just laying there holding their breath and they know they had the conversation before like okay this is what these people are going to do like the lifeguard doesn't know if okay they've been down there for two minutes uh, is that too much or, oh shoot, they've been down there for eight minutes. Like, wow, this guy's really good. Um, it's really, so unfortunately, like every year there, there'll be a new article that pops up of someone who died on the bottom of the pool, looking at his watch. And he was known to known regularly at the pool by the lifeguards. as just someone who did this. Um, so that's why in free diving, it's so important that we're always doing this with a trained buddy, not just not just a lifeguard, not your grandmother tanning on the pool deck, or not your not your dog, or um, yeah, it's got to be someone that actually knows how to rescue someone from a, a blackout situation where you held your breath too long and your your brain is just starting to shut things down to preserve the remaining little oxygen for your vitals and to your brain so you don't get brain damage. So it's a good protective mechanism that we have. It's just if you don't have someone to pull you out from that, then unfortunately, like that's, there's no way that you're coming back then. A couple things about that, that come to mind when, and I've heard this story from people who have been, um, drowning survivors or who have gone down too deep. And the conversation is always, there's a moment of panic and then euphoria. And that's when you're just truly drowning. How do you tell the difference when you're doing something like free diving between my body can handle this and this is a good space to I've gotten myself calm enough that there isn't the panic stage and then you just go into the drowning stage without realizing you're drowning? Yeah, very, very real risk. Very, very, very real risk. And that's how uh, most of the free diving blackouts will happen because once you train yourself to be able to overcome the discomfort and um, then, then as your oxygen starts dipping lower and lower and lower, it's actually an intoxicating feeling where you feel, like you said, euphoric and you feel, you feel warm and kind of fuzzy. And that's actually when you need to come out. Like that's when you, <laughs> whereas your, your mind is enjoying that state and it's not painful and you can easily slip into a blackout from that point. Um, so what we do before we just go off and start doing big dives like that, we, we always work our way up to, um, up to a, a new personal best or, or whatever, or we're, we're not just going to say like, okay, well, I dove 20 meters deep yesterday. Let's try 40 meters today. 
Like you want to have a nice slow progressive, um, a, a slow progression in your training. Um, like once you mastered 20 meters, then you're ready for maybe 21 or 22 meters. And once you master that, then you're ready for a little bit more and you just add a little bit more and you make sure that you're always still coming up comfortable, coherent, um, and your buddy will give you feedback on that. Like if, if you come up and you're right on edge, like your buddy will be able to tell right away, um, if they know what, what to look for. So, um, if, if you came up in a situation like that, then you'd want to scale back your dive and then master that little bit less of depth before going on for more. That just, it's interesting because we always learn in any sort of biology that oxygen deprivation is damaging to the brain. So how does that work for free diving? Because that's quite yeah. literally what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So that that's a great question. It's a question that we get quite regularly. So it's, I would say, well, to, to, to back, to go back a second, like free diving as a sport, it's a very young sport and the science behind it is also very young. So a lot of things change, but, um, like they used to say like, oh, it's not no risk at all. Like you're fine. Uh, you can just black out. And then if you knew that you blacked out at, you know, 60 meters deep, then, then, you know, okay, well maybe I can do a dive that's 58 meters and I'll be safe. Um, right. you know, so, so it used to be kind of like the free diving way to train, to find your blackout point, subtract a bit and then go from there. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but now, I don't want to do that. Just, yeah. Now, now they're saying it's more a question of doses. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that there, there were studies of people who have been free diving at a high level for 30 years or 25 years or so. And they're now in their, their fifties and they've done, um, like brain skin, like MRIs on their brain. And, um, and they haven't found any conclusive evidence of brain damage. And these are people that were regularly blacking out. Um, but logically, like it, it seems quite obvious that if you, if you're pushing your brain to the point of blacking out regularly over and over and over and over and over, there's going to be a little bit of each time, uh, maybe minor damage each time that's building up, building up, building up over a lifetime, then it could affect you into older age. But to be clear, like a blackout in free diving, it's actually your body's protective mechanism to preserve the remaining oxygen for your brain and for your vitals to keep you alive. So as if you're, if you black out and someone knows how to rescue you quickly and they do it efficiently, quickly, and you're back breathing again within about 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds, that would be 95% of the blackouts. They're really easy to, to rescue someone from and they're back really quick. Um, my, from my perspective, I suspect that there's really not going to be long-term issues from a blackout like that. Um, but then if you're blacking out way underwater and then people have to pull you up to the surface and then try to get you back on the surface, now you're blacked out for 30 seconds or maybe as much as a minute. Whereas in the first case, you're only blacked out for 10 seconds or so. So like it, it it certainly it's it's logical to think that on these bigger blackouts where it takes a lot more time to get you back then um long term if you if you start adding up multiple blackouts like that then over time it's you're gonna have some effects to your your brain but um certainly right now conclusive there's nothing conclusive but there's also so little science behind free diving that you know like i can't tell you yes or no um one way or the other but yeah, just using your logical mind, it's not a good idea to to black out. Certainly, certainly not regularly. Accidents do happen, and that's why we dive with trained buddies. But um, yeah, we want to be safe and we want to protect our minds so that we can do this for all our lives, really. Right. It, it's it's interesting too because, like I said, you know, at the beginning of the conversation, science has come so far when it comes to the mind and the body and what we do to it. As before, we used to think that if you hit your head off a wall, if you didn't knock out, there was nothing wrong. But now we mm -hmm. understand very conclusively <laughs> across the board, unanimously, that can do enough damage to cause a TBI. So it's interesting to watch the development of. Um, understanding of what the brain can handle uh just over time just from learning the hard way 
a lot of times just <laughs> learning the hard way. But I do find that fascinating though, because, you know, as a child, oxygen deprivation has never been something that has been promoted, but in a sport like this, that is quite literally uh, a necessity to be able to do this successfully. So mm -hmm. I've been watching and kind of looking into a little bit more of free diving and something I found interesting in competition, and maybe this was just at this specific event. If you come up from the free dive, I saw that there had to be people watching you to see if you were with it or not. And if you weren't with it, they didn't count the dive as successful. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's um, protocols that we have in free diving competitions to prevent people from just you know, just sending it, you know, like, just yeah. like, oh, let's, let's just try this massive dive. And I hope that I get away with it. So instead it's, it's making sure that the diver doesn't just make it up, but that they're, they're coming up and they're still coherent enough to do what we call a surface protocol. So that would be, you have to take off your, your dive mask, or if you're using a nose clip, you have to take that off and then you have to do an okay sign. And then you have to say, I'm okay. All within the first 15 seconds. So if you came up and you're right on edge and you can just keep your head above water, but you can't do this, the rest of this stuff, then your dive doesn't count. Or if you came up and you blacked out on the surface, your dive doesn't count. Or if you blacked out underwater, your dive doesn't count. So it's just to discourage people from doing reckless things and reckless dives. Um, still, once again, because in a freediving competition, they're pushing the absolute boundaries of what's humanly possible with with diving deep or in the pool for distance or time that often they will come up and they will have blackout incidents or or stuff like that and that's something that you don't want to encourage in the sport um and it gives a bad perception to the sport too for people that don't really understand what's going on um so we try to all divers are not trying to black out it's just <laughs> You, you will see online, there are blackout videos and um, before the point of blacking out, you'll have what's called a loss of motor control where your brain is starting to shut things down, but it hasn't shut off your consciousness. So you might see people come up and they start kind of bobbing their head and shaking their arms a bit. Um, so yeah, that these are kind of things that we don't want to experience. We don't, we want to have nice, clean, enjoyable dives, but we have safety teams there and and people um, there just in case of an accident were, were to happen. What is the protocol? Sorry, all these questions are just rapid firing in my brain. Yeah. What is the what is the protocol when somebody does blackout? What is the amount of time before you're allowed to dive again? Or logically, should you be diving again? So the rule of thumb in the free dive community is 24 hours. Just take, take it off for the rest of the day because um, one, your body just went through a lot of stress. And then two, you just, you want to be disciplined in the sense that you don't just jump back into diving and, um, and not learn anything from your incident that you just had. It's really important that you go through what happened during that dive, what led up to the dive to the point that you had a blackout. And this might even take a couple of days. Like for me, when I, I didn't have a full blackout, but I had a really bad LMC before where I was really shaking. And I, if, if it wasn't for my buddies there, I would have dipped back in the water and I, I would have died. Um, it took me probably even a week just to get back into it because going back to the mind, like my mind was just shook up by that. That was my first incident that I ever had. And, and it was, kind of like a, a good reminder that we have to take things seriously. We can't let your ego get in the way and just be like, Oh, well, I can do this amount of time or I can go this far. You have to progress slowly and respect the sport. Um, so it took me probably about a week to learn from, from that. Whereas some people, they might be diving a few days later or maybe even a day later, but certainly would never recommend that people just go back and dive right away. When an incident like that happens to you, and I'm, forgive me, you don't know me very well, if this is too personal, but this is pretty normal standard questions for me. Do you ever utilize psychedelics after an incident like that to work through a trauma of, you know, having that conversation of, hey, we're going to go do this again, and there's a potential that I might drown again? Yeah, no, good question. But no, personally, I, I don't uh, use any sort of substances, not even cigarettes or 
I used to smoke cigars a lot, but no, I cut that out too. Even alcohol, like I, I used to drink quite a bit, what maybe 10 years ago or so, but it wasn't good for me. It was nothing good was coming out of it. So I, um, stopped drinking more or less, like I'll still have a glass of wine at Christmas or that kind of thing. But, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just, I just avoid all sorts of substances in day-to-day life. Yeah. Fair enough. That's Hey, to each his Um, own. Yeah. (laughs) Go ahead. And, um, some often I'll have people actually ask, like, can I smoke weed before I die? Because it helps me relax and stuff like that. But that, that also, we, we would never promote that. We would never encourage that because even if, even if you're off just a little bit or your perception of time is off by five seconds or so in a rescue incident or any sort of incident like that, like every single second is precious. And it's really important that you're doing things like robotically almost that, that Mm -hmm. you're able to, Um, Not just look after your own safety, but someone else's safety. Hey, you. Have you checked in with yourself today? How are you doing? How are you feeling? Have you had enough water? This is your midday check-in, brought to you by Midday Squares. Big breath in. (sighs) I'm back at it. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't mean while you were free diving. <laughs> I was okay, more no, I, I got that. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I got that from the first okay. question. But then just okay. to clarify for people out there listening who think like, oh, you know what, like, weed really helps me relax. Like, maybe this is something that I can get a boost in my free diving. Like, yeah, definitely. Please don't do that. Yeah, I don't recommend I, I never recommend substances when doing an activity like that. Although I will say a microdose of psilocybin before a long road bike ride does wonders for the mind. That is my that is the way I, my brain works. But I wouldn't recommend it when you're dealing with uh, water or any sort of safety uh, along those lines as well. My next question pertains to the fact that you've been bitten by a shark. Can we have that conversation considering you live in Ontario? Uh, yeah. I'd like to pretend that we don't have sharks, right? In our lakes, we don't. Although we do know that bull sharks can live in freshwater. Please tell me it wasn't in one of the lakes. It was in a swimming pool. Sorry? No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> so, Hold on. No. Wait, stop it. <laughs> yeah. No, it was in the Bahamas. We took a, okay. a trip to the Bahamas. My friend Jeff Coombs and I, uh, this was probably about five years ago. Okay. And... Um, we were we were on a spear fishing trip so you can also combine free diving with catching fish um so we love going to the bahamas for this um we don't worry about diving deep or any of the competitive stuff we're just there to catch some fish and enjoy some time in the ocean where we don't have the same marine life of course in ontario so it's always such a special trip that we make um and then on that trip we were diving with a few or sorry, we, we were doing that trip with a few friends who didn't dive. So they were just hanging out on the beach or um, at the at the cottage and, and that kind of stuff. So then one of the days we took off from regular diving and we just went on a boat across uh, some of the northern Exuma Keys, like islands. And there's this one touristy place where you can dock your boat. You pay like $10 a person or something and then you can hop in the water where they're chumming for nurse sharks. It's just nurse sharks. Um, and you can go, yeah, you swim with them, take pictures, whatever. Um, so my friend Jeff and I, we were, we hopped in, we're swimming around with these nurse sharks. There's lots of them, like dozens probably. And they're the operator of this tourist, um, tourist attraction thing what they do is they dump in a bunch of chum, like chopped up lobster and chopped up mm. fish guts and stuff. And then the, the nurse sharks go crazy and they're all right there. That's what keeps them coming back. Um, so I told my friend Jeff, like, okay, they, they just dumped a buck, a bucket of this chum in. So I told my friend Jeff that I'm going to go to the bottom. I'm going to lay on the bottom in the sand and just look up and watch them go crazy feeding. So obviously like this isn't, there's probably everyone (laughs) listening is like what an idiot so yeah I I go to the bottom I'm watching the sharks go crazy it was pretty cool um and then I'm running low on air so I have to go back up and I wasn't using any fins like usually we're diving with these big fins or some people might know them as flippers um but I was just doing it with no fins so I was using my arms and my legs to stroke 
So as I was stroking with my arms to, to swim, swim back to the surface and swim away from the sharks just to get out of the, the frenzy, then uh, one of the nurse sharks saw that, I guess my fingers trailing like this, and <laughs> that, that looked an awful lot like chopped up lobster. And so it came on and it bit me, but thankfully it didn't hang on because even a nurse shark on your fingers, it could rip your fingers off. Oh yeah. And it could be pretty serious, even though you think like, oh, it's just a nurse shark. Um, but thankfully, as soon as it bit down, it realized, oh wait, that's that's not food. Sorry. Right. <laughs> and it swam off. Um, we made eye contact. And, and <laughs> in my in my mind, that was him saying sorry. So whatever. Oops. <laughs> yeah sorry yeah, um so i, I i'm that. i now i'm at the surface and i'm looking at my hand and um just the way the nurse sharks are they have like three or four rows of teeth uh, of teeth and they're really tiny teeth but they're really sharp so i, I had a lot of blood streaming down my arm mm -hmm. and so i tell my friend jeff like jeff i just got bit i'm getting out like sharks and blood not a good idea <laughs> not ideal so, uh, he looks at me he looks at his camera and he looks it back at me and he looks at his camera, and then he goes back to taking pictures of the shark. <laughs> <laughs> and so, good old Jeff looking out out for me in a time of need. So I I go back to the dock. It wasn't far. Like I, I I'm not ripping on Jeff. I'm just I like to tease him about that incident. Um. So then I I start climbing up this ladder to get back onto the deck and then get my hand cleaned up. And as just just such funny timing. As I'm climbing up this ladder with blood streaming down my arm then there's that tour guide who just had dumped the lobster in he was telling a massive group that just showed up on his dock like a, a group of probably 30 people or maybe even 40 that oh yeah like these you can just jump in you know like swim with them take some pictures they're safe no one ever gets bit he was having that conversation <laughs> as i'm cl climbing up with my bleeding <laughs> arm and it was just so funny the the look on everyone's face um everyone was just like i'm out of here like i'm not jumping in nope yeah um, well they have an unassuming name nurse sharks they have this yeah. unassuming like calm demeanor about them but we do that with other animals in the world though right where we're like Absolutely. bear bears they're cute and cuddly have mm -hmm. you seen what a bear will do to a living human being if it gets a hold of you and it really doesn't yeah. like you. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we do this to nature where we make people think that it's safe to go up to a bison in the middle of Yukon and be like, Hey, what's up? You're going to get trampled to death. You yeah. risk, you take that risk when you, when you put yourself in any environment. And, but for him to sit there and say, no one ever gets bit as you are just being bit climbing yeah. up the ladder just seems irrational to me. Oh. It, it was it was hilarious um but to his credit like i suspect that they really haven't had many incidents if any because when i show him my hand and stuff and then he, he goes and gets his other buddy and, and a couple other people involved they're scrambling around trying to find something to deal with my hand like they didn't have any gauze or anything like that no no nothing to treat it so then <laughs> Like, I, I don't think that it's a regular incident. In yeah, this particular area. it's <laughs> just such like funny it. timing. Um, but um, I absolutely agree with you. Like, um, in the free dive community, too, like, you'll often see people posting on Instagram about shark dives and, and diving with bull sharks or what have you, some of the bigger sharks. And they almost make it sound like they're these cuddly creatures and they they're totally safe. Like there's absolutely safe ways that you can dive with them, but it'll always have a risk in the, you know, the risk that's always there. There's ways to mitigate those risks and you can dive and weigh that in your own mind and dive with them. Like I've dealt with other sharks since that incident, bigger ones, bull sharks, Galapagos sharks, sandbar sharks, bigger sharks like that. I never had an incident. It's just, there is a risk. They're wild creatures and they, they have a mind of their own. They have their natural tendencies, but they're still, if they make a mistake, like in my case, it wasn't that that nurse shark was mad at me. It just happened to think that I looked like chopped up lobster. Um, so in an accident like that, or your friend that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, Paul. Um, Paul de Gelder. Yeah. yeah. Lost, yeah. Uh, he lost his, I think it was his left, left leg and right hand. He was, um, 
in 2009, he was a Navy diver and oh, wow. uh, he, he was a diver. Yeah. For the Australian military. And he, they were not like, like you, they weren't doing anything. He just jumped in the water and his buddy got out and he jumped in. And I think Paul, I'm not butchering this, but he jumped in and within like five minutes, he was just kind of floating in the Sydney Harbor. And, um, a, I think he said it was a, I want, don't want to misspeak. He's gotten a really, he's got a really amazing book. That's actually coming out right now. Um, Paul's new book is Paul de Gelder. So please go grab that. Um, but he, he just, he got bit and it, and it pulled him down. I think it was a bull shark and it came back though and grabbed his hand and then he went down. And I had that conversation with him on the show about that, that drowning feeling and that, what that, that must've been like. And for whatever reason, the psychopath has no issue swimming with them now and has no problem with it and does all of these massive dives for shark week. And it blows my mind because, you know, I've said to him, I was like, are you not afraid going back in the water? And he goes, no, because at the end of the day, I'm in their environment. And when you mm -hmm. treat them with respect, you, you still have to understand that accidents happen, things happen, and they don't necessarily mean to be hurting you. But an exploratory bite from a shark of any size is still yeah. an exploratory bite from something with multiple rows of teeth that is stronger than you by a long shot. Yeah, for sure. Like, yeah. I was just really grateful that that nurse shark didn't latch on. It just, it bit down and that, that was it. So I just had some, some minor cuts like that healed, I don't know, within a few weeks. And I had, I did have a lot of bruising just because of the power of the, the jaws. Um, so for me, I got off extremely easy. Even if that, if that shark would have held on and latched on for even a few seconds, I could have lost all, all my fingers on this hand. So I'm really grateful for that. I mean, having your fingers is great, but how great would it be to just thumbs up everyone all the time? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's Good point. Just your hand of just like, that's life. <laughs> that would be your new, you could literally write a book about that and that would be your cover with no Oh, fingers. I know, it's yeah. Just... <laughs> Man, maybe I should go back to the Bahamas. Right? Uh, speaking of that, now I'm a little nervous. I'm going there in March and I'm like, well, don't die. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true when you're in these environments and I, and I had this conversation before we started and it was that, you know, do you prefer to dive in lakes or would you prefer to dive out somewhere like in British Columbia? My thought would be lakes because of, like you said, the wildlife, but I mean, it's murkier out here. We do have great whites. If you go past the Island, we do have orcas. We do have these other sea life creatures, which I don't know how comfortable I would feel diving free diving outside of British Columbia with zero visibility and these animals being in the water with me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like each, each location that you can dive, it will have its own unique hazards and unique uh, wildlife that you have to um, understand their tendencies and their, their risks so that you can go out there and dive safely. But murky water is definitely something that adds a lot of risks in from a free diving perspective or a scuba perspective because from a safety perspective like now if you're relying on a buddy who can't see you then there's other protocols that we can put into place like attach the diver to a line and a lanyard so you always know where the diver is but then still like it's so much nicer to be able to see your diver even mm -hmm. if they're on a line and lanyard um can yeah, we talk in, in any risk yep no, no, for sure. Can we talk about um, competitions for you? Because you have been diving now, you've been free diving. So can we talk about any sort of competitions that you have done? Um, kind of give us an overview of what those look like. Yeah, sure. So competitions for me, I'm not a, a world record diver or anything. I'm diving like half is what they can do. So for me, it's always just been um, more of a a recreational thing where I get to meet some new friends, hang out for a weekend, uh, maybe try set a personal best or, or what have you, because prim primarily like I'm training in cold water all the time. Whereas if you want to really perform for the sake of performing and maximizing your physical potential and mental potential, then you want to do that somewhere sheltered and warm with good visibility somewhere like um, Dean's blue hole in the Bahamas, or there's a blue hole in Dahab where you just have to step offshore and you're already at a hundred meters deep. Um, so for me, like competitions, I've always treated them relatively lightheartedly where I'm just competing against myself. Um, knowing that 
you know, I'm not in ideal conditions. Like our competition that, that we dive at annually in Quebec, uh, it has some really sharp thermoclines. So 10 meters deep or about 30 feet, then it drops from the surface temperature, which is maybe a max of around 20 in the summer. It drops down to about 10 Celsius. And then as you go from 10 meters deep or 30 feet down to about 25 meters or about 80 feet, then it, at that at that 80 foot mark, 25 meters, then it drops down to four degrees Celsius. So it's four degrees Celsius year round. Ooh. And so if you're do doing a dive, that's like, I think my deepest dive there was 63 meters deep, like 200 and 207 feet or whatever it was, then over half of my dive, I'm doing it in this really cold water where your wetsuit's also being compressed. So at the surface, you had this nice thick wetsuit, but now when you add water pressure, it's compressing and now you don't have as much insulation from the cold. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely not I, an ideal place to dive in that sense, but I still love it. Just going back there every year to compete in this cold water. Um, it, it, it's just such a, I don't know. It's, it's my bread and butter, I guess. There's something special for everyone about home. Like if you think about your own house that you live in, it might not be the nicest house on the, on the block. It might not be the, the nicest house in your, your town or your city, but it's just, there's something about going to your own home. That's really special. It's familiar. It's comfortable. You feel confident there. Um, there, there's, it, there's just something special that even though it's not the best place to dive, it's just, fam it's, it's just this homey feeling of, of diving in cold water like this. Um, I've always had in the back of my mind, what if I was to take a season and really try dive somewhere warm where I don't just have three months of the year to properly train where I can train for depth, you know, year round and see what my potential is. But, but I just, never got around to that because I guess life life for me is more than just free diving also like I have a, a wife I have a baby we like to do other sports um, free diving is definitely our primary sport but then for us there's more to life than just diving so you know to take a whole year off and to leave our home <laughs> and just uproot like that I don't know if I have it in me whereas lots of divers do and and they're the ones that are setting massive depths and even if they're not setting national records or world records they're they're still coming awfully close to the actual human potential and they're, i really have a lot of admiration for the work that goes into that because i know how much work goes into what i'm doing and then they're able to dive you know almost twice as deep which is just insane to me to think what is the current world record do you know yeah, so freediving has different disciplines and the same as any other sport. So I guess the the classic freediving discipline where you're swimming down and then swimming back up, we call that constant weight. So the the world record for that is 131 meters deep. So it's about 430 feet, roughly like that. Ooh. On one breath, yeah, so it's way down there. Um, and then the deepest, deepest that anyone has ever been on a breath hold is um, officially 253 meters, I believe, uh, something like 700 feet. So what this guy did is he took a, a sled down, like a weighted sled mm -hmm. that just drops you really, really fast. And he doesn't have to do anything. He's just holding on. He's basically doing like a, a static breath hold on a couch. He's not moving at all. All he's doing is focusing on equalizing the pressure in his ears. So that he can go deeper. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the bottom, he gets off of the sled by opening up a scuba valve, which then fills up a lift bag and he gets a free ride also up. So he's, he's doing like a static breath hold the whole time, so to speak. But now he's, he's able to see what the actual physical limitation is for, for, from a depth perspective on one breath um so that that yeah that world record he went back to beat his 253 meter world record uh maybe a year later or so and he attempted 
um like i think it was another 20 meters like 273 meters something like that it was it was 800 feet anyways which is just like the scuba world record is something like 100 feet like it's <laughs> awfully close to the scuba world record where they're going down with a million tanks on their back um but yeah on on that dive when he went back to try break his own world record he unfortunately had a really serious case of decompression sickness because um that's something we normally don't have to worry about free diving recreationally at recreational depths you're taking one breath at surface pressure so there's such little nitrogen in that you really don't have to worry about dcs um in your average recreational diving whereas he's taking the same breath but he's taking it to insane pressures so mm-hmm. then on his way back up he's still supposed to do a safety stop and hang there for about a minute at 30 meters or 100 feet and then slowly go up from there but because he was so deep he had so much um nitrogen in his system that he had extreme narcosis and he just like on scuba how you heard nitrogen narcosis normally you don't have to worry about that free diving but at these pressures um then he got really bad narcosis he fell asleep from it um not blacked out like he was he still had enough oxygen but he was just so so Mm -hmm. out of it mentally that fell asleep and he missed his safety stop and then got really debilitating decompression sickness from that he was in a wheelchair for like three years and he couldn't talk thankfully though free diving as a therapy therapy and a motivation for him got him back into the water out of the wheelchair out of the hospital and uh he's now able to dive i i heard he can dive 100 meters again like regular Whoa. diving with it. He, he's done with the sled stuff but yeah he's, he's still like a really top level diver it's just he only strictly does it recreationally now for for fun and he's done with the the records <laughs> so well i mean it, how much further do you need to go yeah he's already proved to everyone that he's incredible an incredible athlete incredible um capabilities that he's developed going literally where no man has gone before by far like i think the next the second deepest person was like f- something like 170 meters type thing like way way less or 100 and 185 maybe i don't know something like that i think it was less than 200 meters so he's going like a full 200 feet deeper than these people it's just insane how does somebody obviously when you're dealing with with pressure because when i think about going down the depths obviously you get the 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 pressure with the nose and your ears and everything feels like it's swelling but how does somebody surpass that how does somebody get past that because that seems like something that's a little bit harder to control yeah for sure one of the most difficult things to learn free diving is what we call equalization which is just dealing with the pressure in your ears so to to give you a really quick idea of ways that we overcome it there's a few different ways but the the most simple way that most people can learn within a day is what we call valsalva equalization where you pinch your nose and you just try blow through your nose so you might have done this on an airplane before or if you're a scuba diver you might have done it scuba diving Um, So that will do it. That will equalize the pressure in your ears. And then it feels like you're on the surface again. So anyone out there who's been swimming to the bottom of the swimming pool and they feel that pressure in their ears, if you were to pinch your nose and try blow through your nose, then it feels like you're on the surface again. Like your your ears are equalized. The pressure is equalized. Because what's happening is our middle ear, so behind our eardrum, it's an airspace. As we go down, that that airspace is compressing from the added water pressure that's pushing against our eardrum. Our eardrum is bending in and that's what, that's where the discomfort and pain would be Mm -hmm. coming from, from that eardrum bending in. So then when you add, add pressure back to your middle ear by blowing air up through your eustachian tubes back into your middle ear, then it pops your eardrum back out straight. feels like you're on the surface again. You can go deeper. And as you go deeper, it bends and then you equalize pop bends pop. And you're able to go deeper and deeper and deeper while you continue doing that. Ugh. There's so many <laughs> little tricks and things to this, but it's it's really fascinating learning about the what looks like the most simplistic activity in the world is really quite complicated, dangerous, and uh, very difficult to master. 
how do people, if they want to learn how to get into this or where do they go? Do they just Google your name? How do they learn how to become a free diver if this is something they're interested in doing? Yeah, for sure. Good question. Um, out there in any major city, typically there's some sort of free diving club or uh, free diving instructor. Um, you, the best place to do would, or the best thing to do, the easiest thing would be to just um, do a Google search of your area. Um, type in like free diving courses. Um, there's good instructors out there. There's bad instructors out there, unfortunately, just like any other sport. Um, but typically like in Canada, I know that there, if you're in Canada, I don't know if most of your listeners are in Canada, but in Canada, I know like in the major cities like Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, Toronto, I think there's even one in Edmonton, Halifax. There's all, there's good, good instructors in all those locations. Um, unfortunately, because Canada is so sparsely populated in between the big cities, if you're in between, then it's really quite difficult and you might have to get on a plane and go somewhere either to these big cities within Canada or, uh, somewhere warm where there's lots of instructors everywhere. So, um, yeah, to get into the sport, I would definitely never recommend just doing what I did where you're <laughs> Googling some things and you're going out by yourself, trying those things. Because if you if you were to have a blackout incident or learn the wrong thing and you're by yourself and or you're with someone who doesn't know how to properly rescue you, then then unfortunately that's that's the end of you and you can't dive another day. So um yeah, it's definitely important in my view to always take a a, a course with a reputable instructor. It definitely doesn't have to be me. Like I'm not trying to sell anyone courses or anything. <laughs> No worries. Um, but but just do a little bit of research before you choose an instructor and you should be fine. Yeah, no worries. Don't uh, most of our listeners are American and otherwise. So you're awesome. I'm, I'm sure you won't be getting a huge hit of Torontonians coming up to you being like, teach me how to dive. Tell me where you live. I want to yeah, go to your lake. Yeah. You should be good on that front. Although I can't speak for all of my listeners because a few might do that. But it is, it is great to have you on. And it's so, it's so great to learn about this because like I said, in the, in the way that the world is changing, there are ways to look after our bodies and our mental health. And sometimes they're unorthodox and they can be done through other great sports that you can do no matter your physical fitness level and ailment. If you want to go learn something different, you should take the risk and go learn it. Um, people are always looking for things especially for mental wellness and being in the water, being in nature, being outside is something that we promote a lot. So to have an activity that you could potentially grow and learn with like free diving is, is really great to hear. And I'm so glad that you found it in your life. I'm glad that you didn't drown, uh, learning it the sketchy way because we wouldn't yeah. be able to have this conversation, but it sounds like not only the water, but the camaraderie and the community based around this is uh, something that was great for your life, obviously finding your wife in that and then being able to have the great family you do. So I'm really glad uh, to have you on the show. Could you do me a favor and tell everyone where they can find you and your wife? You have a great YouTube channel, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So you, YouTube and any, any social media, like you can find us um, on Instagram. My wife and I, I'm, I'm Andrewper at Andrewper, A-N-D-R-O-O-P-R. Um, same with TikTok. We have TikTok. Um, my wife, Lily, she's Lil Freediver. So L-I-L, then Freediver. So her name is Lily. So it's kind of <laughs> cute and fun. Um, so yeah, Instagram and TikTok, that would be where we are. And then YouTube, I think my channel name is Andrewper, the same name. And then just with free diving on the end of it. Um, our website is ontariofreedivers.com. Um, that's that's where we have some, yeah, like, I guess our, our hub where we have our courses listed or um, ice tours listed, stuff like that. Um, where else are we? That That's probably about it. Yeah, Facebook. We have a Facebook, but we don't really use it. <laughs> Facebook, I feel like is now our mother's generation has has taken over that space. So Instagram probably is for most of the people here. If you're a little bit younger, maybe TikTok. We have a lot of fun videos <laughs> there. So 
Yeah, your videos are great. And and I know we didn't get a chance to touch on it, but your photographer is fantastic. And the photos that come out of it and the quality of the content is, is amazing. And I would definitely recommend going to watch your YouTube. It's just great educationally, but it really gives you a little bit uh, of a picture into your lives and what it's like to not only free dive, but also cold water diving and um, just all of the things that go around that. And I think it's really interesting to see that you found others that were like, I'll hold a camera for you underwater and freeze. I don't know where you recruit your people from, but it seems like it's a good spot. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, it's just funny when I look back on my life, um, I just see how uh, people came into my life at just certain times. And it was just so amazing. Like Jeff originally from my first course and right away we became best friends and, and dive buddies. And we, grew off of each other so much like one day he'd be the better diver and then the next day I'd be a little bit deeper and then that would motivate him to go a bit deeper and da-da. and we'd, we'd give each other feedback and learn from each other so much and so he came into my life like at the beginning of it and then my wife of course came in um, later like uh, maybe four or five years yeah maybe 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 four years after I started something like that halfway through the journey and now um, now I have a wife and a baby with her so yeah, like it's just amazing to to also have that relationship with Jeff outside of diving. Like I said before, diving isn't my whole life. Like we were we were best men at each other's weddings and you know, we go hang out for dinners and stuff like that. And he has a baby too and a beautiful wife too now. So it's just kind of funny how free diving built such strong relationships with different people too. Like uh, it's not just that Jeff and Lily are the only people that I dive with. There's dozens of other people out there in Ontario that I just look back and I'm so grateful for all of them. Well, I love that. I love that you guys have found community because that's really the key in my personal opinion to success in life. It's about finding the community that to surround yourself with that is going to not only push you from a physical standpoint, a psychological standpoint, but also give you give you the love and support that's so needed in this world nowadays. And so I'm so glad that free diving uh, was the route for you in that. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation because there's un unorthodox other things going around in the world that you can find that you can utilize and you can bring into your life and you never know who you might meet in those, but it's about finding the community that works for you. So I am really grateful, Andrew, for your time. Thank you so much for coming on this week's episode. We will put everything in the bio for everyone to find you and Lily and your amazing free diving company where you can go and dive with you in Ontario or Ontario. depends on where you're from. Either way, I'm super grateful for your time. Thank you so much for coming on this week's episode. And uh, everyone, that's Andrew. We'll see you all next week. Awesome. Thanks a lot.